Figure it out. Hello, this is Adam Corlick from Figure It Out Productions. The following video is a video of some kind, and I hope you enjoy it. Hey guys, it's Adam here, and today we're going to be talking about this, a hacked PlayStation 3. Before we do that, though, do me a favor, like this video, comment down below, subscribe if you've never done that, and hit me up on social media, all that stuff's in the description, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Discord, Patreon, etc. And do me a favor, please, follow my new channel called Flying and Eating. It's all about adventuring and seeing the world and checking out restaurants, recommendations. I think you guys would enjoy it if you enjoy adventuring, and you get to do it for free without ever having to leave your own house. I do all the hard work for you. Anyway, I appreciate the support. Now... Let's talk about <clears throat> this, the hacked PlayStation 3. Uh, I want to be very clear about this, though, before we get started. This is not a video about how to hack a console. It's more like, I'm a guy who just got one that was already hacked, so let's take a look at it. Let's review it, essentially, see what it can do, what it can't do. If you're that guy out there who's just curious what it's capable of, this is the video for you. Um, if you are looking to hack one yourself, I highly recommend Mr. Mario. He's another YouTuber. He's done a million videos about that type of thing, and he's really the go-to for that sort of stuff. Also, also, also an awesome guy. Now, let's talk about this. Um, so this particular console was actually one I bought in Japan years ago uh, for like $50. Uh, I just saw this fat 60 gigabyte PS3, and I was like, oh, cool, you know, and brought it back. It basically worked. There was just one issue with it, which was that the DVD laser was dead. Uh, so it would read, like, music CDs and Blu-ray discs, but it wouldn't read uh, most PS2 games, um, which was kind of a hindrance, so I just put it off to the side over there, and I was like, one day I'll deal with this. Uh, that day eventually came when my buddy Justin at Power Up Gaming, who is the one that ultimately completed this project, uh, and I highly recommend him if you want this. The guy's done a lot of great mod and repair work for me, uh, so I'll put a link to his stuff in the description. Go check him out if you are at all interested in this or any of the other type of stuff he does, because he does a lot of crazy things. Um, but yeah, he ultimately worked on it. I just handed it off to him, and he's like, yeah, I'll fix it up for you. It's no problem. So originally, that was all he was going to do. was just, you want me to just fix the laser? That's it. And I was like, well, what else can we do? He's like, I guess we could hack it. And that's exactly what he did. So let's talk, let's do a little bullet points on what exactly those hacks were. Uh, first and foremost, the most obvious, it has custom firmware on it, which makes it capable of doing all sorts of stuff that Sony never intended for it, but that the fan community has allowed to make possible. And we'll go into the little details of that later. Uh, we replaced the original 60 gigabyte hard drive. This is the original one that came inside of it, just the standard, you know, SATA uh, laptop style drive. And we intended to replace it with this. This is a two terabyte Samsung SSD. And as you can see, it's clearly not in the console. So why didn't that pan out? Well, as it turns out, um, the PlayStation 3, we knew this going in, that it's not able to actually support a two terabyte SSD uh, the, or two terabyte hard drive in general. The most it can actually support due to Sony doing weird things with the PS3 is 1.7 terabytes. Now, that's not exactly a standard hard drive size. So we were under the impression that if you put a two terabyte in it, you can basically allocate it to essentially think it's 1.7 and just ignore the other 300 gigs or so. And then after it's formatted and all that sort of stuff, you would end up with probably about 1.55 terabytes of usable space. That was our hope. Unfortunately, that did not pan out. Uh, it was just not stable and wouldn't run correctly with that. So we went down to the next uh, SSD tier, which is just a one terabyte SSD, which is what's in there currently. Now, I know people are going to point this out, so we'll just get it out of the way. Yes, obviously, you could put in a 1.5 terabyte mechanical drive, uh, similar to this, but obviously bigger as far as data allotments go. You could do that, and you would get 500 gigabytes more than what I have. And why would I put an SSD in it? I'm, I cannot wait for the keyboard warriors to tell me, like, you realize it doesn't have any real benefit because blah, blah. I get it. I get it. The, the, the PS3 is old and is not really able to utilize the benefits that are inherent to an SSD's performance. I'm aware. The amount of performance value you get out of it in difference is, is minor. It's really just like no seek times. It's a little bit better here and there. It's, it's not really worth it from the performance perspective. Well, then why'd you do it? I did it because <laughs> I hate moving parts. I hate mechanical drives. They're inherently unreliable. This is something I want to last for many, many years. PS3s, particularly the launch models, infamous for failure. They break very easily. The same thing with my uh, uh, Xbox 360 launch edition, or well, not launch edition, but my hacked 360 that is an early edition that is famous for getting red rings of death. Had Mr. Mario, who actually did the installation in that case, replace the internal drive with an SSD for one simple reason. 
performance stability. I want it to live. <laughs> and less moving parts means that that's vastly more likely. That's the only reason we went with an SSD. Uh, after formatting and all that, you end up with about 930 gigabytes of usable space. So what do you need all that space for? Well, as I said, you can put on all sorts of custom apps and all sorts of things. Uh, and that's pretty much all we did with it. Like he repaired it, he put in the custom firmware, he put in the one terabyte SSD, and he also did as much preventative maintenance as possible. Things like uh, he replaced the thermal paste and all that sort of stuff just to kind of ensure that this thing is almost like a brand new, as if made this year, PlayStation 3. Now, if PS3 hacking is so easy now, and there's so many different versions of the PS3, why pick this particular one? And that's a very good question, because the PS3 Slim is more abundant, uh, it's cheaper, it's smaller, it has almost every benefit, it's just as hackable, and it lives a lot longer, it's better built. Why go with this? One simple reason, and the entire reason I got it in the first place when I found it in Japan is PS2 support. People tend to forget this now, but the launch PS3, particularly what the 60 gigabyte model as well as the 20 gigabyte model that came out in North America and Japan, sadly Europe never actually got this. Um, I know what you're, uh, Europeans, I see you typing around, like, we had the big PS3, what are you talking about? I know what you're wrong. No, listen, trust me. The launch PS3 in North America as well as Japan had PlayStation 2 hardware inside of it. Uh, Sony was, at the time, their attitude towards backwards compatibility was completely opposite to what it is now. Uh, which was, uh, we wanted to play everything PlayStation. So they built a PS1 emulator inside of it. They put PS2 hardware in it, and of course the new PS3 tech at the time. Um, but because the PS3 launch did not go very well, they had to find ways to cut costs down. And the easiest place to cut was to get rid of all the PlayStation 2 hardware. Uh, so after that, they released what is now known as the 80 gigabyte model, which looks very similar, but it's slimmed down in a few different ways. I believe it, they went from four USB ports to two and so on and so forth. And it could still play PlayStation 2 games, but it did, through, did it through emulation. And it did it very poorly. And then shortly after that, they phased out the entire PS2 support thing altogether. So what I'm, that's a long way of saying, I got this for PS2 games, and that's it. That's what I wanted it for. I wanted it so I would have a Japanese high def PlayStation 2. Because I already own the American version of this. I got it in 2006 when it came out. So I was like, I got the American one, I'll have the Japanese one. And as I said, there was no European version of this. The European launch console did not have the PS2 hardware in it. I believe you guys did it through software emulation initially and then phased it out faster than the rest of us. Europe got very screwed on that. Um, but anyway, uh, but once it's hacked, well, you kind of get it. Now it can play everything. And that's the point. <laughs> um, this PlayStation 3 is not only capable of playing PS3 games from all regions, because th th here's a North American game, Japanese game, European game. We got, you know, Resistance Fall of Man, we got Yakuza 1 and 2 HD, and we've got Siren Blood Curse. Now, the PS3 discs are already region free. This is irrelevant. Who cares? Well, yes, now it plays PS1 games from every region, sort of. There's an asterisk with that. Um, PS1 games, Twisted Metal 2, North American, plays this no problem. Uh, we, there's, a, uh, there's a Japanese exclusive Beavis and Butthead game that it, it's now capable of playing, no problem. And then here's a PAL game, this is Chaos Break, uh, one of the few that I actually have. This was a very cool Resident Evil clone that came out at the time. Um, but, and, but the problem is it doesn't play PAL ones. Um, it's weird actually, so it will detect what the PAL one is, and then it will give you, and it'll try to boot it, and then it will simply say something about a video frequency issue, because presumably because it's trying to run at 50 hertz. That's the one that I can't figure out. If anybody out there knows, like if, you, if you're in the hacking of PS3 scene, you know anything about like why it won't launch this and if there's anything I can do to trick it into getting past this. Fortunately, that problem doesn't exist when we get to what I, what I wanted it for. Japanese PS2 game. This is Metal Slug 2006. This was like a 3D chibi remake of Metal, uh, Metal Slug that nobody really remembers anymore. Plays Japanese games, no problem. Plays American games. This is Siren for the PS2. Great little horror game. Plays it, no problem. And we have a European exclusive, at least, well, it came out in Japan, but we didn't get it in North America. Forbidden Siren 2, sequel to that, uh, was a European horror game. It actually runs this. This doesn't have that like weird video frequency issue. I don't know why, but I'm very glad it does because it was the whole point. So that's that's why I wanted it. So let's, let's fire it up and take a look at it, and I'll show you some of the quirks. Now, um, you'll notice that I have I have that hard drive connected. 
There's a reason for that, and we'll talk all about it. But let's let's first take a look at this dashboard here. So you'll notice it boots up and says Evil Net. It's there's multiple different types of custom firmware out there. This is just what uh, Justin installed on this as he put um, Evil Net. Now, uh, it basically looks the same. It has a few different, you know, odds and ends and things are different. Um, but it, you know, you, you can then install your own software and do all sorts of stuff. So I'll just break down some of the more key elements. Um, so I, include, I, I installed this myself. Now you have the ability to install your own what are called package files. Package files are basically apps and software. You can either use them by installing them via some sort of uh, USB device such as this hard drive, or if you want to, you can actually use uh, FTP software, which is what I was doing. Every time I would get a new piece of uh, software, you know, you open up, uh, if, if you know anything about networking, you have to know stuff about networking, um, which I'm actually surprisingly good at. Um, but th yeah, so I would just st uh, send files over, then you, you know, run them like, you remember when you got a PS3 and you would download something every once in a while and then it, you would get the file and it would say you have to install this first and you'd be like, it would just present it as like a weird little bubble and then it would install, the bubble part would go away and then the game would appear or whatever. That's kind of the same thing that you have to do with these package files. You would download them, you put them into the right package folder, install it, and that's how you get apps like Simple File Manager. Simple File Manager is great uh, because it actually allows the console to read uh, different formatted drives. Um, normally, a PlayStation 3 can only read FAT32. Simple File Manager, uh, it allows it to read NTFS formatted drives as well as XFAT. This one's actually NTFS formatted and it totally works. Um, which is great because then you're no longer limited to those comical size limitations of FAT32, which is four gigabytes, which is comical. It's just horribly small. Anyway, so that's good for sending data across from one device to the console or console back to the hard drive, which is useful if you're going to install games in bulk or if you want to use the console to rip games and send them to the hard drive, et cetera, et cetera, for whatever your purposes are, very useful tool. Um, this is Artemis PS3. I installed this. This is basically like a trainer device. So think of it as Game Shark. I haven't had much use for it yet, but it's there. Uh, Chaos Break. Now we'll get back to this, but this is a copy of Chaos Break, a Japanese like PSN build that I threw onto it. We'll get back to that, and that's also mostly because I just can't play my actual disc unless somebody helps me with that. But yeah, that's there. Then you have some of the other random software. Mana Guns. <laughs> This, I like this software in concept. Um, I'll, I'll boot it up and I'll show it to you. Um, it can do a lot of great things in theory, but in practice, it doesn't seem to work much. So here it's, it's scanning the entire system to see like, you know, what, what we've got going on here. Um, so it detects what PS3 games I have installed, what PS2 games I've got, what PS1 games. And I should have mentioned this before, it can actually play PSP stuff. How cool is that? Um, but yeah, it basically detects all of it. Now, you, you, um, if you remember, when you put a PlayStation a disc into the PS3, it has to basically present itself as a disc on the menu, and then you boot it from there. Now, when you have a hard drive or whatever, we're doing this method here. It, it's not like this is just a list of games you can just boot and just go straight. It's not like an EverDrive or whatever. So basically, software like this is what's called a loader, and it basically has to tell the system, okay, this disk, this ISO, this file, you now think of this as the thing that's in the disk drive. And that's that's key. So basically from there, you just pick whatever you want and you go. But this particular software, I don't actually recommend for that purpose. This software, I'm not really sure what to do with because this one has all sorts of great features and none of them work. Um, for example, uh, this software allows the console to rip PS1, PS2, and PS3 disks. Now, if you guys know anything about me, if you've been watching me for years, you know that I actually archive all my disks. Um, and PS1 and PS2 stuff is relatively easy. PS3 is a little harder. There's like a specific Blu-ray drive I have installed in one of my computers and it, it can read PS3 and actually PS4 discs. What I didn't know until this came around was that those discs were still encrypted and that the software, the, this, the PS3 can't crack that software. But the back door to that is to just re-rip the, the discs using this PlayStation 3. It will decrypt them and generate new ISOs that I can use. Problem is, most of the software that claims it can do that doesn't do it successfully, and this is one of those. This will successfully rip a PlayStation 3 formatted disc. It can rip it to an encrypted ISO, it can rip it to what it claims is an unencrypted ISO, and it can even rip it to raw files. But every single one is unbootable. I don't really know what the point of this software is. I'm sure there's something. It's not like they just didn't recognize one of the most giant omissions about this thing's capabilities. But that said, I couldn't get it to do anything. 
Um, also, one of the cool features about this software, so it claims, is that if you try to run PS2 games on it, it actually has a feature, uh, if I can boot it up here, yeah, so like it's got a bunch of features for PlayStation 2 stuff, and one of them that's amazing is it can enable or disable 480p. This one I actually set to enable. So the idea would be that uh, most PS2 games run at 480i, which is part of why it looks so bad on modern televisions. Um, by forcing 480p, theoretically, it can look better. However, every single game I tried to boot in 480p through this software just wouldn't boot. It always failed. I just... The software is sadly very disappointing to me, uh, despite having so many proclaimed great features, none of them seem to work. But that could just be, your experience may vary, you know, that's all I can really say about that. Um, so let's go back to the dashboard and I'll show you guys some other stuff. Uh, this is MMCM. This was my hero, we'll get back to that in a second. Uh, this is the PSP Remaster Launcher. I I've noticed from time to time when I boot this up, sometimes it just appears like as this little generic PlayStation logo, and other times it shows its art. Um, the thing with that is that's actually what you have to use to launch PSP games. So, uh, like I mentioned before with loaders, you'd have to load up the ISO in one piece of software, and then rather than click on it to activate, you click on this, and then that will activate the PSP game. I'll probably show you guys that in a bit. Uh, and the other thing down here is Rebug Toolbox, which has some features that I really didn't need much of, but they're there. Um, the other one we've got here is Webman. Now, I'm sure if you know anything about PS3 hacking scene, you, you're very familiar with this. Webman is the best loader. It just is. Um, and so this is the one I would typically recommend for actually loading games. So it creates uh, folders and it detects what you have sitting in there. So right now, Webman detects... 20 PlayStation 3 games, it detects 201 PlayStation 2 games, 91 PS1 games, and one PSP game. Um, so I'll show you an example here. Let's let's pull up, uh, literally the first one is the 007 World on, you know, and you just click that, and now, as you saw there, it pops up, yeah, it PlayStation formatted disc. So it now thinks that 007, whatever that name of that game is, uh, <laughs> Agent Under Fire, I think. Uh, no, World is Not Enough, whatever it is. It now thinks that's in the disk drive, and Webman told it to go, so we click on it, and it will then, after a second, it'll just load up as if that's actually what's in there. Uh, now, obviously, because it's reading off the hard drive, and especially in this case with an SSD, like it's, it's loading to the absolute pinnacle of speeds capable for the PlayStation 3. So in overall, like the load times there are superior to what they would be traditionally when running it off a disk, uh, not surprisingly. Uh, but you, you get the idea, like that's, that's all it really takes once you, you have it running. So let's just quit this because we don't actually need this to, to run. Um, but that's the same basic process that's all that's necessary for loading stuff in there. The key is getting Webman to actually notice stuff. And so let's talk a little bit about file structure. Now, the, the folder structure for this thing was completely set up already for me when I got it, so there really was nothing special I had to do. It's just that I observed it not only through the file software that I talked about there a second ago, which is uh, Simple File Manager. Actually, I wanna show you one little feature because you're probably like, well, okay, how do I eject the disk? There's no disk, you know, you can do this thing and sit, remove disk, that doesn't do anything. You have to go back to Webman, uh, Webman Setup, and then you go down and you hit Unmount Disk, and now it thinks the disk is gone. Um, so that's key. Um, but yes, so I, I went into the folder structure internally on this thing just to kind of figure out what I could learn. And that's where you'll notice things like there's a folder called like packages, and that's where you send your package files and stuff like that. Uh, there's also very specific folders, and this is important. There's ones called, uh, they're labeled like PSP ISOs, PSX ISOs, PS2 ISOs, and PS3 ISOs. Guess where your games go? <laughs> they have to go in those very specific folders. Um, and the same, this, actually the PS3 games it detected are not actually on this. And that's another big one. I didn't know this, but this thing can actually read disks externally via USB. Um, I can't promise that's always going to be as stable. Theoretically, it should be. It uses USB 2.0, which is pretty much the cap the max that was under the hood as well. It's not like the PlayStation 2 when you hack it where the disk drive actually performs better than the USB ports because those are like USB 1.0 ports. Theoretically, this should work fine, but I can't say with 100% certainty that it always will. I would recommend if you're going to do that, maybe just use PS1 and PS2 games through that. Maybe not so much PS3, but again, it seemed to work fine when I was trying it, but I can't promise that in all situations. Um, but, but anyway, oh, oh, if you are going to do that, by the way, so you see I've got this SSD just chilling there. You might have noticed it's taken up two USB ports. I connected it with what's called a USB Y cable. Uh, a USB Y cable basically 
hence the name, it splits it into two and it looks like a Y. Uh, one, one port then is utilizing the data while the other port is utilizing power. USB 2.0 wasn't really meant to send that much power and data at the same time. So having two ports runs for a more stable connection. I'm not saying it won't work with one port. Honestly, I don't even really know, but two ports with a Y cable, seems to be totally fine. It seems to like that. And I, I learned that the hard way with the Wii U when that one was hacked. Anyway, um, but yeah, Webman is great as a loader, but it has some issues. And I've noticed that if you put a game on it, you send it over an FTP, you rip the disc, whatever you do, Webman typically will not recognize it until like one or two reboot cycles later. Um, I don't entirely know why, but get used to it with a hacked PS3. If you rip something and you don't see it, reboot your ps3 a couple times before it'll show up but also make sure it's in the right directory of course but yeah that's just how it typically is this is a, a be patient it needs a lot of rebooting um but yeah so uh let's go down to this software i was talking about this was my hero software mmcm uh this one this did everything i really kind of could ask of it uh it takes a second to boot in there and so then you've got access to everything it detects. Now, this is where it's like straight up detecting every ISO that's ripped currently on that hard drive. As I said, I was archiving my own games and just putting them there, which brings me to the point about ripping PS3 ISOs. As I said, this thing can do that, and this is actually how I recommend doing it with this particular software. If you are gonna ever rip disks or you wanna boot anything from this particular menu, put the disk in at this menu. If you put the, the disk in before you get to this menu, the software doesn't detect it. Don't know why. <laughs> uh, so there it is, the game has displayed. Uh, so if you press triangle on it, you'll get a whole bunch of options and one of them at the bottom is create ISO. Now from there, it would take, you know, it takes a long time, keep that in mind, to rip ISOs depending on the size of the game. That's the thing though, uh, a lot of the time this software doesn't tell you if it failed. Uh, it, sometimes it does and other times it doesn't. Um, the way you'll know if it worked is, other than just booting, trying to boot the game, is if you check the file structure, there will always be three files. There will be like, in that case, it would have been resistance.iso. It would have created something called like resistance.png, which is a little like artwork. Like you see this little icon there, the resistance ball of man thing? That, there's, that's just a little PNG file. It would create that. And the last file it will create is like resistance.q, uh, C-U-E. If it creates all three files, you're good. Uh, if it only creates two, it means it failed. And, but it just didn't tell you that it failed because it likes to piss you off. Um, but yeah, anyway, so that's that. Uh, one other cool thing about this is that it actually, because, all right, so you can connect it online. It's actually connected online right now, but it's not connected to the PSN. It's connected to fan-made servers. Those servers contain a lot of data, uh, one of which is patches. So if you were worried about patches and all that stuff, I guess you don't really have to be because a lot of the, the fan community has kept that alive, which is phenomenal. So this thing can download those patches straight up and install them, no problem. Uh, highly recommended. One thing though that's very odd about it, like really odd about it, is it doesn't read burn discs. I was legit stunned by that. Like, I mean, it doesn't need it. This is a different era now if you're gonna do everything through digital means of, you know, putting ISOs on there. But like, if you just straight up like, Hey man, I have a couple of like from the old, like you know the early aughts. I'm sitting on like a stack of my old PS2 burn discs or whatever I you know ripped from Blockbuster or whatever you did. Oddly, despite being hacked, this thing doesn't seem to read them. I tried a bunch just to be like, would it do it? It never acknowledges them. I think one time, the software I was just showing you uh, acknowledged a PS2 burn disc as a PS1 disc. That was the closest I ever got, and it wouldn't attempt to play it at that point. Very strange, but you know, that's all there is to that. Um, oh, see, there you go. Like now, now it shows the PSP software. Actually, if we're gonna do that, let me try and show you a PSP game running. I only have one installed on here, which is um, Power Stone Collection. So now it's loaded, and then we you have to launch it with the remaster, uh, PSP launcher remaster, and then from there it, it should just work just fine. Yeah, there you go. And then they tell, it asks you like what version of the software you want to use. Uh, we're just, it doesn't really matter. I, I can't read Japanese, but it doesn't really matter. That's, that's the bootloader that gets the PSP game going. And now there you go. You've got PSP games working on this thing. Um, which is cool to me. Like my, my primary interest with this, as I said, is PlayStation 2 games. Uh, PS1 games to a lesser extent. Uh, PSP games is just a bonus. Now, 
The hard drive, like I said, we put into it 930 gigabytes after you remove all that stuff. Um, and that's cool because that's more than enough for my entire PS2 collection and with a ton of room to advance. Um, but actually, let me talk about one other little bug that I've noticed. So if you go into your the system settings, um, you can go down to right there. And at the bottom, it will show you system information. And one of those things, in my case, 931 gigs, 449 of it is available. The rest is completely just taken up by PlayStation 2 and PS1 games. Um, I noticed an interesting glitch that I think if you guys are anything like me and you're like out there like, oh man, I'm going to use this to archive my collection, whatever, because technically you can do that with all of them, although I really would just rip PS3 discs with it. As I was ripping PS3 discs, not surprisingly, that first number was going down. That makes sense. You're eating up the space. Um, eventually, after I the hard drive was as full as it could go, because that's more data than you know the PS3. Uh, sorry, the, the PS3 collection I have is bigger than that data allotment. So you would go to a certain point. As soon as you got basically full, you have to transfer everything off of it, which is what I was kind of using this hard drive as a transfer device. Um, as soon as that's done, you can go back and delete the games off the internal drive, right? So I would do that, and it got down to 11 gigabytes. I'm like, great, it's done, delete them all, boom. I would delete them through the FTP software, or I would delete them from the internal software, which was that CMN man thing that I was showing you guys a second ago. Uh, not Webman, the other one. The, the one I said was good and did everything. You can delete them from there. And I, would, and I was like, all right, let's proceed. I'm going to go back and make sure, like, the. Oh, I'm just curious. Like, how, how big is the hard drive? What do we got going on? And it would just stay at 11 gigabytes. And I was like, uh-oh. I noticed there was a flaw that, for some reason, the data management doesn't necessarily adjust correctly. And then I was like, I would reboot it a bunch of times. That wouldn't do anything. I was like, this is bad. Because if it thinks there's only 11 gigs, that means it's going to start causing problems. Long story short with all of this, I figured out how to fix that. If you, like, so the PS3 is on right now, right? It's stable. There's nothing wrong with it. If you do, if you've ever had a PS3, I'm sure you made this mistake at some point. It either turned off by accident or you just you press the power switch on the back and you did a hard shutdown. If you ever turn the PS3 off that way, then turn it back on, it will yell at you. It'll give you this like error screen be like, you didn't shut me off right. I'm mad. Anyway, I'm going to scan myself now to make sure I'm okay because you don't even care. It's, it's very passive aggressive. Um, but yeah, so it does this thing and then it has to like rebuild its like database or whatever. When it did that, then the hard drive space was all cleared up and it was the way it was supposed to be. So if you ever run into that issue, technically that's a solution, but probably not a recommended one, but I couldn't think of anything else to solve that problem, but that did work. Um, but yeah, like, so let me think, what, what else can I tell you? Uh, yeah, it, oh, okay. This is important to understand. Uh, I put this on here out of curiosity. This is something called PKGI. Now, this program is, I purely put this on here so that you guys could see for educational purposes, what else this thing is technically capable of. This is software that I'm sure is, the software itself is legal, but what it does is probably very, very illegal. I'm gonna boot it up here for you. Think of this as PSN if everything on PSN was free. So right there, every single one of these things is a game. You can organize this in any number of ways, whatever. Um, yeah. Let's see, all, no, well, okay, I can't really read what I'm doing from here, but anyway, all that stuff, it's PS1 games, it's PS2 games, PS3 games, PSP games, basically, you can click on any one of these games, um, and then it will download that game, and it will send it to the dashboard of the console, uh, let me quit out of this, from there, it'll send it to the dashboard of the console, uh, provided you have it in the right package structure and all that sort of stuff is set up. But once it's there, you just install it and there you go. You have all the free games you ever want. I, again, that's not legal. <laughs> I want to be very clear about that. It's just that technically that software exists. And I'm going to admit, like, yes, that's how I got Chaos Break. Now, I actually own Chaos Break. That's the reason I, I did this, just to prove that this, you know, what it's capable of. But once you do it, it's just like those digital games that are displayed if you had a PS3. Um, will boot up and then you can actually you know play those games uh, but technically yes you, you can you can do all that sort of stuff um, so I'm just throwing that out there for educational purposes again I, I don't it's not that's a gray area I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend doing it in my experience it ran it had a lot of 
hacked console problems, which is it's, you're asking it to do things it was never really intended to do, uh, and you're now more dependent on what hackers came up with as opposed to what Sony came up with. And in a lot of those instances, you, you get glitches. You get stuff that doesn't run correctly or doesn't work right. Actually, one thing that's really kind of bizarre... So, all right, check this. The PlayStation 3 is the only Blu-ray-based console ever made that actually plays games directly off of the disc. Um, if you put in, like, an actual PS3 disc, like Resistance Fall of Man, while I don't remember the specifics of this particular game, it might require an install, but it might not. There was a lot of games where it just plays direct. But there's also, as I'm sure a lot of you remember, games that require you to install chunks of the game in advance. Something like a Metal Gear Solid 4 or whatever. And some games where you're just kind of stunned that they even need it at all. So let me let me pull this up because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make an example here. Um... And then there's some games where it just gave you the option. Like, sometimes you could do it. And I think one of the little big planets did that, where it was like, you don't have to install anything, but if you do, performance will be better, blah, blah, blah. Um, so let's let's take a look here at some stuff. Now, this, this example, Sonic and Sega All-Stars Racing, for sure, I know this game does not require an install of any kind, uh, which is important to the point I'm about to make. Whereas a game, uh, where is it, uh, Wipeout HD, which is a European exclusive game that I've got. This is a small game, but despite that, it requires an installation. Now, why does that matter? Well, as I said, the PS3 doesn't think of those as pre-installed games. It thinks of them as discs. So, in essence, you have the, the ISO on the hard drive. You have the disc on the hard drive, but it still needs to install to the hard drive. So, it's essentially cloning itself to itself in order for it to run. It can be weird. And the only reason that really matters, other than just seeming odd, is that while it didn't seem to actually cause any sort of performance issues in the games, you have to take that into account when you're installing your games. For example, let's say you, you're like, I don't need this for PS2 stuff. I just want I just want PS3 games on this thing. That's all I want to do is install my entire PS3 game, make all my set and make it all digital. I don't want to deal with the discs, whatever your goal is. And you're like, okay, I have one terabyte hard drive in there, which means I have 930 gigabytes to play with. I've ripped all my discs. Uh, my whole collection is like 800 gigs. So cool, it'll all fit. Maybe? <laughs> you, have to, you have to account for, like, let's say Metal Gear Solid 4 is one of those discs. And you're like, oh, no, that game's 44 gigabytes. It's all good. I don't need any more space to think about. Well, that game still has to separately install, despite it already being installed. So it can create, like, oh, a 44 gigabyte game is now... 80 gigabytes, potentially, depending on that particular game. So keep that in mind. All I'm really saying is, if you allocate a certain amount of space to a particular game, it might actually still need more, because in essence it has to duplicate itself. Because, again, the PS3 thinks those ISOs are actually disks in the disk drive. Does it make sense? You following me? And the nice bonus to this, as soon as this video is over, I wanted to be very clear, like, I intend to get another hacked PS3, but I'll probably do it on like a Super Slim or something, and I'll just put my PS3 games there. This is this is my PlayStation 2 now. Just you might as well just scratch that Spider-Man 3 off and put on Spider-Man 2 there, this Spider-Man font. This is now, and when everybody asks me like, what do I do to get the best video quality out of a PlayStation 2? You need a fat 60 gigabyte PS3, but a hacked one, is even better because then you have all the regions in it. Theoretically, according to some of the software, you even have additional resolution enhancements, but like I said, I couldn't actually get that to work. But the PS3 will artificially um, take the all the PS2 games, which pretty much run at 480i for the most part, and will output via 720p, um, which is much more stable and much nicer looking. Uh, and then a legit 720p, not, the, not like, oh, I just stuck a thing on the back and it technically is 720p, it actually runs nicer. But then, at that point, it can have additional benefits, like I can, you can run it with an M Classic or whatever, and even get more performance out of it. Um, so, this is the way to play PlayStation 2. Is The whole point of this video, aside from just, yeah, there's all the stuff a hacked PS3 can do. Really? I just wanted to approach this from, what does a hacked PS3 do when it comes to PlayStation 2? And if you guys want, maybe separately, I'll do an entire video about, like, performance with the PS2 games. Like, what do they actually look like compared to, you know, with, like, a standard PS2 versus this. But long story short with all that, yeah, it runs way better on this. This is the best version of the PlayStation 2. But also stay tuned because at some point, inevitably, I'm going to get a PS3 Slim. I'm going to have that hacked up. 
and then I'll have like the ultimate PS3 next to the ultimate PS2. And if you're wondering like, well, dude, why not just run your PS3 games on this? Because like I said at the beginning, this particular model of the PS3 is not common and it also is highly prone to failure. And if I can prolong its life by not forcing it to play PS3 games when I have, there's a plethora of PS3s out there, and that's what I'm gonna do. So there you go. Um, I just want to say thank you again to Justin for doing all the work on this and getting us all set up. I'm looking forward to finally getting to really enjoy the PlayStation 2 again. Uh, that I think will be a, a really good time. If you guys could do me a favor, please again like this video, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't done that before. Go to the social media stuff, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Discord, Patreon, all that. And again, please check out my new channel. I, I think you guys will really enjoy it over there. Uh, and that's it. Thank you guys very much for watching uh, and I'll see you all later.